Good morning and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Kira Proctor and I'm the Managing Director here at the A. Proctor Group Limited. This is the 16th in our webinar series, which we've been running since April, and you can go back and view all of the series on demand here on our YouTube channel or through our learning hub at www.proctorgroup.com. As well as viewing our webinars, you can also order up product information and samples for everything featured in each webinar, or book in for a follow-up online meeting with our team of advisors and specialists around the country. Today, we're going to revisit our acoustics webinar, which we originally broadcast back in May, but we'll be following up with a brand new Q&A session, so you can send our team your questions either here in the chat box on YouTube, DM us on Twitter at Proctor Group, or send us an email at webinar at proctorgroup.com. These days, we're probably better known for our construction membranes, but we've been involved in building acoustics for a very long time. Our Profloor Dynamic Battens received their BBA certificate in 1989, back when my father Alan was running the business. In today's webinar, we're going to look at how sound transfer in building works and what regulations are applicable across the UK. We'll finish up by taking a look at our range of flooring systems designed to reduce the impact of noise on building occupants. It's estimated that up to a third of UK households experience noise-related problems, with a third of these related directly to noise from neighbours. As well as an increase in living density and more construction of flatter developments, widespread use of home cinema systems and hi-fi equipment has contributed to driving this rise. Design trends such as laminate floors or stripping carpets to expose floorboards have also added to the problems. Before we consider how to address these problems, let's begin by looking at some of the terminology used and how this relates to buildings. There are two types of sound we're concerned with when designing buildings, airborne sound and impact sound. Airborne sound. Miles, come on, buddy. No. Airborne sound typically originates from sources like TVs, home cinemas and stereo systems. Human voices are also a source of airborne sound, but it's generally bass frequencies from entertainment systems that create the most issues, as these are the most difficult sounds to restrict. This type of sound is caused by the source vibrating the air to create sound waves. When these waves strike the walls, roofs or floors of a building, they are converted into vibrations in the structure, which then transfers the sound around the building. This sound is then re-emitted by other surfaces, in the same way as a speaker generates sounds. Airborne sound can come from outside the building as well as within, and typically travels in all directions throughout the structure. Building regulations therefore require most building elements to have some degree of airborne sound resistance built in. Impact sound. Impact sound occurs when mechanical impacts cause vibrations in the structure directly rather than via an external sound wave. Impact sound comes primarily from footsteps and it's here that bare floorboards or laminate flooring cause problems as carpets and underlay contribute a lot to reducing these impacts. As with airborne sound, these vibrations pass through the structure before being re-emitted in other areas. Unlike airborne sound though, the regulations regarding impact sound are typically only concerned with sound transmission between the floors of a building. We'll now take a look at some of the properties of walls and floors that can affect the sound transmission within buildings. A thorough understanding of these factors is important when designing structures to perform well acoustically. Mass. When considering acoustics, the mass of the wall or floor is a very important factor. The heavier the element is, the harder it is for incoming sound waves to induce any vibrations. This has the effect of reflecting a greater proportion of the incident sound waves, resulting in less sound being transferred into the structure. Heavy elements such as brick walls or concrete floor slabs are therefore better able to restrict the passage of sound, particularly those problematic low frequencies, than lighter timber frame structures. It is, however, not always practical or economically viable to use high mass construction. This is particularly true in refurbishment projects where increasing the mass is often impossible. Stiffness. 
The stiffness of the structure is important as it dictates the ability of the structure to vibrate. While the mass of an element restricts the absorption of sound waves, the stiffness restricts their transfer once absorbed. The property governing this is the modulus of the element, in other words, the ratio of depth to length. A shallow and wide beam will vibrate more than a deep and narrow one, allowing for a greater amplitude of vibration and therefore more sound to be transferred. A related property here is resonance. Every part of the structure will have a frequency at which it vibrates more readily. This is the natural or resonant frequency. If the natural frequency of, for example, a wall, coincides with a frequency in the incident sound, the effect may be able to amplify rather than reduce the sound. Careful consideration of the stiffness and frequency response is therefore necessary to avoid this. Isolation. An effective way to prevent sound transmission through structures is by physically isolating one side from the other. This can be achieved by either using entirely separate structural elements, such as independent floor and ceiling joists, or by using resilient mountings for floor and ceiling surfaces. This approach aims to break the pathway for sound to travel through the structure, from one side to the other. With independent structures, there is an actual discontinuity in the pathway, leading to the best acoustic performance. However, this approach results in very thick wall or floor elements, so is not always practical, and as such, tends to be used only when acoustic performance is the primary concern, such as in recording studios. Resilient layers are usually a cheaper, thinner and lighter weight solution. They can be applied in the form of floor deck or batten systems, as ceiling mounting bars, or commonly, both. These work similarly to car suspension by damping the vibrations and reducing the energy from the sound waves by allowing a degree of movement. These systems must be carefully matched to the loadings expected on floors as heavy weights can damage the layer and reduce their effectiveness. Absorbency. Absorbent acoustic materials work by reducing the echoes within cavities in a wall or floor construction. This has the effect of breaking up the sound waves in these spaces. This reduces the overall energy transfer by converting the energy in the sound waves into heat due to friction between adjacent fibres. Fibrous materials such as mineral or polyester quills are usually used for this purpose, most commonly in timber or steel frame structures. If there are voids present, partially filling them with an absorbent material will generally help reduce the sound transfer. Flanking Flanking transmission occurs when sound can pass around the sides of an element, for example, bypassing a floor construction by passing through the walls instead. This can result in elements with well-designed and specific acoustic insulation failing to perform as well as intended. Flanking transmission can be minimised by paying attention to how linkages between floors and the supporting walls are designed. However, outside of new build constructions, this can be difficult to achieve. It's therefore not uncommon in refurbishment projects to over-specify the acoustic insulation to account for the unknown quantity of flanking transmission. Acoustic floating floor systems will typically use a strip of foam at all perimeters to prevent a physical contact between the walked-on surface and the surrounding structure. Building regulations The building regulations for acoustics have remained relatively stable since the mid-2000s. The precise details vary across the UK, with slightly different variations used in England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, but there's a lot in common which we will consider here. The regulations set requirements for impact and or airborne sound transmission across separating walls between adjacent properties and for airborne sound only within a single dwelling. Between dwellings, floors are required to resist both impact and airborne sound, and walls to resist only airborne sound. Between dwellings and commercial properties, such as shops or offices, 
Only airborne sound insulation is required. Where a roof terrace or balcony is over a dwelling, impact sound insulation is required. These requirements are expressed by way of a single figure value, which combines the sound levels across the full spectrum of frequencies into a single number. Depending on the regional variations across the UK, this can be weighted to emphasise different frequencies or make the requirement more or less stringent. In general though, acoustic requirements are expressed in terms of decibels, dB, of reduction in sound pressure. For airborne sound, this is expressed as dB dNTW, with a higher single figure value indicating better acoustic performance. For impact sound, dB LNTW is used, with a lower number indicating better performance. The requirements are reduced slightly for refurbishment and conversion projects, to reflect the practicalities of introducing acoustic insulation into an existing structure. This can include period features that are listed, or unknown existing details or defects that cannot be easily remedied. These single figure values do not vary linearly with perceived loudness. A change of 10 dB in the acoustic performance equates to a doubling or halving of the perceived loudness. This makes the scale used very sensitive, but it also makes it difficult for the human ear to detect subtle variations in acoustic performance. Testing and compliance. Because of the difficulty in accurate perception by the human ear, an important aspect of the regulations is a mechanism to ensure compliance. Again, the specifics of this differ between the various parts of the UK, but pre-completion testing of at least some proportion of separating walls and floors features across the country. Acoustic testing is a complex process and should only be undertaken by those appropriately accredited by organisations such as the United Kingdom Accreditation Service, UCAS, or registered with the Association of Noise Consultants. Testing for airborne sound is typically done using an omnidirectional speaker to play a predefined pattern of noise which can be measured by sensitive microphones and sound meters in adjacent rooms. The figure quoted is the difference in sound levels across the partition, so a higher figure is better. The sound source used is usually pink noise, which has an equal power per octave, giving more weight to low frequencies than white noise, which more evenly distributes sound power. This shift in frequency is quite noticeable when the two colours of noise are played back to back. Impact sound is measured using a tapping machine to simulate footfall. Tapping machines use a camshaft to drop carefully calibrating weights in a precisely defined rhythm. This sound is then measured in the room on the other side of the separating floor. In the case of impact sound, only the level in the receiving room is measured, so a lower result indicates better performance, the opposite way around from airborne sound measurements. The equipment used to measure the sound must be very sensitive, so during testing it's critical that certain site conditions are met. The building under test should be more or less complete, with doors and windows in place. A lot of noise can transfer through openings, so it's also important that vents and ducts are in place, or their openings are sealed. Site noise should also be minimised during testing. Ideally testing should be undertaken at night when no work is being done on site and noise from machinery and traffic will be minimised. Any extra noise from site work, etc. will lead to poor results or possibly even test failure, so it's in everyone's best interest to ensure the correct test procedure is followed. As an alternative to testing, designers can use approved robust detail constructions to comply with building regulations. These are standardised subfloor types to which pre-approved floor and ceiling treatments can be applied. Because these construction types have been tested thoroughly ahead of time and have consistently exceeded the regulation requirements, they can be used without testing, provided they are followed to the letter. 
The Ape Proctor Group have floating floor treatments to suit most robust floor types, with a range of systems approved in floating floor treatment, FFT categories 1, 2, 3 and 5. As well as floor type and acoustic treatments, robust detail also includes standard details for the junctions and connections between walls and floors in order to minimise flanking transmission. Acoustic Floor Systems Overview There are two principal types of acoustic flooring systems and a few other less common ones. Batten Systems Batten systems such as Profloor Dynamic Battens are most popular in new build timber frame floors and are the top performing floating system. The extra depth introduced between the battens not only simplifies service runs within the floor, but also provides additional void space in which additional fibre layers can be added to boost sound absorbency. The downside to batten systems is that they tend to be thicker, so it may not be practical to apply to all floors if tying into adjacent floor levels is an issue. The A Proctor Group supplies a range of batten systems to cover a variety of different project requirements and floor types. Deck systems. Deck systems are much shallower and can provide a good boost to the impact sound performance of a floor. However, they offer little scope to improve the airborne performance. For that reason, they tend to be more commonly used on concrete floors where base floor mass does most of the work dealing with the airborne noise transfer. Deck systems are also a good fit for refurbishment projects where floor to ceiling height may limit the scope for using a batten system. Systems like the Profloor Microdeck at only 17mm can improve impact performance noticeably while having minimal effect on floor levels, services and internal trims and skirtings. The A-Proctor Group's range of overlay deck systems are designed to provide the optimum balance of performance and thickness while accounting for the practicalities of working within existing properties which may not have ideal access. Other systems. Of the less common systems, levelling systems allow a floor to be raised and levelled while introducing a degree of acoustic performance. This is useful in existing buildings where floors may be substantially off the level, or in new build where pre-stressed slabs may be used which have an inbuilt camber that can be corrected to give a smooth level finished floor. The Proctor Group's Profloor Leveling System uses specifically designed resilient bases with packing pieces to accommodate variations in finished floor level from 51 to 203 mm while still delivering good impact and sound reduction. So that brings us to the end of the presentation and we will now move on to the Q&A session. Apologies, some microphone unmuting issues there. Um, good morning, everyone, which were entirely my fault, um, uh, not, not our marketing team. So good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining another one of our um, webinars. I hope you find it informative um, and educational and that you're doing well and uh, taking care given these ongoing um, times with the, the pandemic. Um, for those of you that have attended before, um, we will attempt to stay on as long as we can to answer any questions we receive. And we've already had a number through email. I can see some coming in on the YouTube uh, chat feed, also on Twitter. So we'll, uh, we'll be checking these as we go and just answer them. So if you have any additional questions, please email them to webinar at proctorgroup.com or post them on the YouTube uh, below. Um, there's a number of things you can do on our webinar page. So um, you can go there and request a sample pack regarding the information uh, that we've discussed today and we will be discussing during the Q&A. You can request a meeting with one of our technical representatives or really gather any information you need about the Proctor Group or our products and the topics we've been discussing. So you can find that at www.proctorgroup forward slash um, You can also download there, of course, your personalised CPD um, for your attendance through our CPD. Um, you will receive an email after this, which will have the link to all these pages, the replay, so feel free to circulate it. It um, also has a link to some feedback. If you um, can fill that out and, and, and send it back, fantastic. We read it all, I personally read all of it, so anything you have, even if it's a little bit critical, you know, we're really happy to learn, um, so it helps future the, the next webinars that we do.
Um, speaking of which, our next webinar is a little further away than usual. So normally we're doing these weekly or bi-weekly. Um, our next one is going to be on Friday the 30th of October at 10 a.m. So it's a little further away because it's requiring quite a lot more work. So it's a really interesting uh, topic that we have planned. Um, so the topic is future homes, concepts and technologies. Um, so essentially, this will cover the sort of critical principles of advanced modern housing design um, and some of the, you know, the sort of fabric technologies um, that enable this. And not only is it a really interesting topic that we're working hard on, we have a really um, special guest who's going to be joining and actually doing a presentation. Um, and his name is uh, Professor Sean Smith. Uh, he's a, a chap that we know very well, has helped us a, a lot in the past. And he's the director of the Centre for Future Infrastructure at the University of Edinburgh. Um, so he, he'll be putting together this presentation and we'll also be doing our bit followed by a Q&A. So he'll be there to join us. Very, very well, well versed and well educated on this topic. So hopefully you can join us. It should be um, an interesting one. So you should be able to join now um, if you go to that webinar page for the webinar on the 30th of October. And of course, we'll be sending the usual prompts and reminders and, and pages. So hopefully you can, you can join us. Um, okay, lastly, if you can give us a thumbs up or like our video, it helps us um, on our YouTube channel. Um, and I think that's it. So we can finally start. So a couple of new faces today. Um, so I'll introduce them first. So we, uh, Linda Kay is our technical sales representative for the north of Scotland. Morning, Linda. Morning. Morning, morning. How are all? Very good, very good. Once I, once I unmuted my microphone, yeah, perfect. Um, and Mark Chambers is our technical sales representative for the west of Scotland. Morning, Mark. Morning from sunny Motherwell. Nice to see everybody. <laughs> nice to see you too. Nice to see you too. Um, and those that don't know, uh, Sue Menmuir is um, in our technical team based in Blair Gowrie. Morning, Sue. Morning. Morning, morning. And Ian Farrington is our technical director, um, also based uh, up in Blair Gowrie. Morning, Ian. Morning. Good morning. Good. Um, so I think we'll, we'll, we'll just start with you, Ian, seeing as I introduced you last, and then we'll come on to some of the other questions. So I'm going to start with some of the ones that have been posted here. Um, so Ian, Simon has asked um, a quick question here. Why are acoustic robust details not applicable for refurbishment? That's a good, uh, good question. Um, <clears throat> the robust details um, was designed principally for, for new build. Uh, the house builders didn't like the idea of having tests done uh, on their solutions, um, which would create quite a lot of delays and things. So robust details was invented and Napier University was heavily involved and indeed uh, our presenter in two weeks time, Sean, uh, was heavily involved in that, as were proctors. Um, our dynamic battens were uh, the benchmark for the timber floors to be used. So robust details was a good idea, but it was following a, a pattern book of designs. So that wall with that floor got that result. Um, so it gave you a res robust uh, performance. In refurbishment, you just don't know what's going to be there. Um, old buildings, you don't know what the junctions will be with the floor joists, whether they're built into the wall or not. So the government recognised that it was going to be more difficult. And as a consequence, you do get a relaxation in, in the requirements for refurbishment to allow for that nuances of the refurbishment. So unfortunately, the bus details wasn't applicable for refurbishment for that very reason. Okay, good. Thanks, Ian. Uh, very concise. Um, so, Mark, welcome. Uh, we have another question from a different Simon. If I can come to you for this one, please. Um, why is a larger figure better for acoustic performance when measuring airborne sound and a lower figure better when measuring impact sound? Okay, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, uh, it's one that uh, confused me when I first started getting involved with acoustics, but it's, it's really quite simple. It's to do with how the, the two airborne or impact is measured. So with airborne sound, um, you have a, a device, a speaker that generates a certain level of dB. Say for an example, it was 100 dB. 
and then that would uh, the noise would go through the wall that you were testing and you'd have a receiving device on the other side and that would measure what it was receiving and say that was 50 db so you would take the difference between the two would be your figure but if you can imagine that if you received it at 20 db then then actually you've reduced it a lot more but the, the difference would be a higher figure and so it's the difference is why it's a higher figure for airborne sound whereas for impact sound You've, I think it was shown on, actually on the webinar, you had that tapping machine, which is sort of calibrated to create a set vibration. And you're only measuring that once underneath. And so that that is just a set figure. So the lower the figure, the better the acoustic performance for that. So it's really just how, how the two are measured. Okay, thanks, Mark. That's great to put it in layman's terms. Um, and obviously an example of the airborne side would be my cat, um, who we heard earlier. Now he has made an appearance on one of these webinars before, but I've locked him in his, um, in his little cupboard or his pantry today, so uh, we won't be seeing him. Um, but I see someone's been making a comment there. Um, Stuart, yeah, very persistent cat, he is indeed. Um, okay, um, so if I can come to you again, uh, well next, sorry, Joseph has asked, um, what is the benefit of a baton system over a deck system? Um, so he's saying he's trying to keep his height to a minimum. Okay, so I mean like a baton system will have various advantages, um, especially when you're talking about lightweight floors such as timber frame for example. Um, in essence what the cavity does, what the baton does it creates a cavity. So that cavity is actually very good, again, for reducing airborne sound. Um, you can put absorbent quilt in between the, in between the battens, um, which again will help reduce the, the, the actual airborne sound. And it also provides um, a space for your services as well, which you don't get with the deck system. So there's various advantages. Um, decks will also have their own advantages, obviously with the depth, but um, Batten systems have slightly more, especially for lightweight floors. Sure. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you, Sue. Um, and Linda, Adam has asked, if I was going to use one of your acoustic floor system, what additional help can, can you give us or can the Proctor Group give, give him? Um, what we have is we have a great technical team at Proctor's. So if you were wanting any help with detailing or uh, acoustic takeoffs, we are there to give you that assistance. But we don't just do that. We have a great acoustic test bank within the Proctor Group. Since we've been in acoustics for 25 years, we've built up quite a lot of different scenarios, if you like. So there might be a makeup that is the same as your floor or very similar to that. So you could have a look through them to see what um, if they would pass or not your acoustic project. Uh, we can also do um, toolbox talks on site. So we're quite happy to go to site as long as it's COVID secure in this new day and age. And we're also happy to discuss um, your project through virtual meetings. This is something that we can do quite happily now. So feel free to give us a, a call. OK, great. If I can come to you for the next one as well, Linda, which kind of links in a little bit. Um, so Claude has asked, why are batten, lay batten layouts helpful? Uh, batten layouts are really helpful. First of all, you've got the tradesmen. Normally, they knew, know what the batten centres are and where to, to use them. But when it comes confusing is when you're using a support batten with a standard resilient batten. So you'd have to maybe come to the Proctor's technical desk and then we would do what you call a batten layout to show the appropriate place to use the battens. So where to put your support battens and where to put your standard resilient battens. So, these drawings are quite, they're colour coded, so you've got different colours for each batten. And then we would look to um, couple that up with details for like partitions or uh, perimeters and also keeps the wastage down because you have a rough idea how many battens you're going to use. So it's quite good for the costs, if you like. And so traditionally, who would ask us for these batten layouts? Would that be the contractor? Do we get that from architects as well? It's mainly from the contractors we would get uh, asked to do a batten layout because they're looking at their system so then we would just say well let's have a look at your details and we'll do your batten layouts for you because they're very cost conscious of course at least it is a thing with them. Well okay thank you Linda. Um, Ian if I can come to you the one via email from Scott and then I'm going to come on to another one on the the YouTube chat and um, Scott says I have a refurbishment project where I was going to use your profile dynamic deck Okay, great. Uh, due to its slim thickness, but the floors are uneven. What can I do? 
Yeah, um, uneven floors. Um, it all depends um, on the the relativity of, of how uneven the floor is. Um, for example, if it's plus or minus three millimetres over a three metre straight edge, then you can install the floor quite happily. Um, if it's larger than that, then you might need to use localised packing underneath a batten, for example, or even a levelling uh, screed if it's really bad. Um, larger than that, we have a, an acoustic system called the Pro Floor Leveling System, which allows the floor to be levelled um, to take in big discrepancies in the floor or in the camber, um, for example, in the precast concrete camber floor. So we can we have that system which allows that system to go in together. Um, it's plastic cradles. We put packers in of two, three, and five millimetres to allow you to level the batten system to go on top and then the flooring on top of that. The old joiners used to use folding wedges, um, but unfortunately that skill is no longer available. We have a much simpler method uh, with the leveling system. Okay, good. I'm amazed you didn't have any props there, and You've always got props, so I'm shocked. I didn't know whether I was going to get a question on leveling bases, and I, I wish I did. I Next I did. time. Next time. Um, okay, and Dave has asked, well, Dave, first of all, thanks for your comments about the graphics. We appreciate the, the feedback that you've put there. Um, and, and Dave's question, Ian, do we have anything for party walls and ceilings rather than floors? Um, party walls, our systems are predominantly for floors, um, and we have an acoustic laboratory um, at Dunkeld Road at our manufacturing facility, um, where we, we basically develop new floor systems. But it also has a, an aperture that we can test for, for walls as well. We have looked at doing a, a party wall system before, um, but there, there's many on the market. Um, we did a big test of maybe 25 different systems, thinking that we could take on some of these systems if they were as good as they portrayed. Unfortunately, we didn't find that they were um, when we tested them. Um, so we, we have looked at developing our own systems. Um, but there are some very good systems out there at a very good rate. Um, gypsum uh, are, are very good with some of their light gauge uh, steel systems. Resilient bars are fantastic for ceilings. Um, so. We haven't really developed another system for that area um, because it's quite a uh, specialist area. So we just concentrate on the floors. Yeah, and I was going to add, obviously, we, because we're quite well known for acoustics, it is a question we get quite frequently. So we'd be happy to point people in the right direction. Um, oh, and I see, sorry, Dave just said, would we share the top five of the systems we've tested? I'm sure yes. If you if you send us an email, Dave, um, just send it to Webinar Proctor Group and I'll make sure that gets to Ian. He can have a discussion and share some of that information um, with our prejudice, obviously. So that would be great. Um, okay, fantastic. Um, Mark, if I can come back to you, please. Um, a question from Paul. Um, Flanking strips seem to come in lots of different widths and thicknesses. Is there an optimal size of flanking strip to suit specific size of the battens? Um, yes, there, there is. Um, um, I'm glad you asked that question because um, I think flanking is an issue that um, should be sort of raised in profile. Everyone concentrates on the sort of battens and the decks because it's all quite exciting, whereas the, the flanking strip tends to be seen as an accessory, but it is very, very important and quite often the problems we have are, are due to flanking. But the, the simple answer is that the, for, for a batten system, you would always use a five mil uh, flanking strip. We, we do a 10 and a seven, but they get used with our with decks. And then in terms of how, the width of the, that would, you would use, it would be depending on the depth of the, uh, of the batten you're, you're looking at. So the, a really common one is a 70 mil um, depth batten. And in that case, we would recommend actually 150 mil of flanking strip and the reason for the it being a bit bigger is that you obviously have to allow for the 70 mil but you also have to allow for the flooring where you would have maybe gypsum plank and and chipboard flooring but then you'd also 
and this way it comes in from an installation point of view, you would want a bit of it hanging over so that when it's all in place, then you can cut it back because it's very important that final bit is in place. So from, from experience, um, we would always go for the bigger size because um, one, it, the, the material is not that dear, but also it, it, it makes the installation um, very good. And that, that is critical when it comes to flanking. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Mark. Another one about sizes. I don't know why I'm picking on you today. Um, if you don't mind, Jodie's asked, from your brochure, the Profloor Dynamic Batten 81mm and your Excel Batten is stated as a solution for a 70mm cavity, so FFT1. Um, how can this work when they're different sizes? Again, yeah, a, a really good question and, and something that I get asked um, quite a bit. And it's really due to the fact that the two battens use different types of insulation or resilient strip. So um, I think we, we, we've sort of covered our, our sort of premier baton, which is the pro floor um, dynamic baton, and that's the 81. And that, that uses two layers, uh, a closed layer of foam and an open layer of foam. It's a, it's, a, it's a system that we're very proud of because it will maintain the, um, the, the performance for the lifespan of the, uh, of the, of, of the building. But more critically, it, it compresses to quite a, quite a degree and that, that acts like a, a very good shock absorber where you get the performance. Um, so the 81 mil is, 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 a, is a lot of compression while it can go down. Whereas the XL baton, uh, the resilient strip is uh, uh, it's a vertically orientated fiber from, from, my, from my dragging that from my memory. And that works in a totally different way. And it, it doesn't need as much compression to work. And that's why the two um, are different, but they're both, um, they both comply to robust details. Um, so, you know, you, you've got your choice between the two. Two, okay, great. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, Sue, a couple of questions here, and then I'll start going back to the ones on the, the YouTube feed. Um, so Sharon's asked a question about attic conversion. So I've been asked to provide acoustic insulation for an attic conversion. What options do you have? Uh, okay, I mean, like the, the requirements for attic conversions um, are predominantly for airborne sound, and they're not actually too onerous anyway, because they are all within the same dwelling. So for your airborne sound, the requirement is 43 dB for airborne, and that's generally just taken up, uh, taken care of by the inclusion of quilt in between your studs and your joists, etc. Um, for impact sound, um, we can supply a really thin deck product, our micro deck, which is only 17 millimetres overall. And what that will do is it will obviously reduce the impact sound, um, provides a level of comfort for, um, you know, like sort of like the rest of the people within the dwelling. Yeah, because I mean, I would imagine these days a lot of people will be converting their attics for living space. You know, an extra is now for a bedroom and often that will come with a, quite a hard floor. So mm -hmm. all Say, as you pointed out, it's airborne sign to have something to help with the impact. I mean, personally, if I was doing that, you'd, you'd think it would be quite logical. So, absolutely, okay, great. Um, and another one, um, from Jim, if that's okay, uh, Sue. I'm doing a refurbishment project and I'd like to know what performance I can expect if I use your dynamic battens. Quite a generic question. Can you try that one? Yeah, I mean, like, obviously, one thing to bear in mind with refurbishment is that, um, you've got an existing structure. So you don't necessarily know how that floor is performing currently. Um, adding a floating floor system onto that will be, you'll probably get different results so like on different refurbishment projects just because you've got these existing conditions. Um, equally, as we heard in the webinar as well, your flanking conditions, there could well be inherent flanking conditions that um, you maybe can't design out. Um, so this will actually, that would actually show itself in a floor test, even though the sound itself is actually traveling through the, through the wall. Um, the best thing to do would actually be to do a pre-test so that you can see exactly how your floor is performing, what frequencies are the, the difficult frequencies or which ones are the, you know, sort of like the more onerous frequencies. And then we can look at the, which system is the best system for you. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, Linda, I've not spoken to you for a little while, um, if that's okay. Um, i ask you a, a couple here, if that's okay. Arnold has asked, I think you were actually chatting about support baton when you were talking about the baton layout, so it's kind of relevant to your last question. Arnold's asked, when would you use a support baton? So um, that's a really good question, actually. Uh, a support baton is used around the perimeter of a room. So that's where there's areas where loads are exceeding 
1.5 kilonewtons per metre squared up to about four kilonewtons per metre squared. And it's mainly on concrete floors. So for instance, it would be areas like your high load areas, like kitchens, bathrooms, you could be looking at cupboards that have water heaters, hallways where there's a lot of people traffic and uh, back and forth. So these are all spaces that uh, would take a lot of weight. So you would use things, the support battens around the perimeters over the concrete floors for that one. Okay, great. And so presumably that involves sending the, the layout, the design of your home or the house and where yes. you're going to be. And we would then do that along with the, the takeoff, would we? Yes, I would say that's a, a good idea to do that if you're using support battens with standard battens. Okay. Position. Great, thank you. Um, another question from the, the same individual. Um, just what's the normal spacing for battens? Oh, yeah. Uh, the normal spacing for battens is if it's a timber floor, you'd be looking at 400 mil centres. So you're up to a maximum of uh, 450 uh, mil centres. And that's if you're using that on an 18 mil chipboard. So if you then went on to use a 22 mil chipboard, you could put your centre to 600 mil centres. Um, for timber so and, and concrete floor, but then you would be looking at your high load areas again. So if it was a uh, timber, you would actually reduce your centres down to 300 mil centres. And then with the concrete floors, you would be looking at your support battens, but you wouldn't have to adjust your uh, centres there. You would still keep your centres at 400 mil for your 18 mil chipboard and uh, 600 mil for your 22 mil chipboard. So is that because with the support battens being a slightly different composition and, and slightly different, you don't need to, re to reduce them? Yes, that's okay. right. And you would just, you could come to the technical uh, desk and give us a shout and we would look through that detail for you and help you with that. That's never a problem. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, Ian, I'm just going to ask one someone's asked on here and then come on to um, a couple of your email. We're on to sort of the last four or five questions. So if anyone has any more, um, please post them now or, or email us. That would be great. Um, so Philip has asked if test on completion, so if the completion testing fails, is it compulsory to redo the entire installation? And so can it still be certified? How does that work? Um. Without being a typical technical director and coming up with the, the phrase depends, um, it would very much depend on, on how much it failed by. Yeah, If it failed by 5, 10 decibels, then the, there's a bigger problem there. If it's one or two, then it might just be something small that we've forgotten or, or missed. Um, so it's really difficult to answer. It's a really good question, um, and I wish I did have the, the magic formula to say, well, this is what you need to do, because um, it all depends on how badly it's, it's failed and whether we can identify exactly where that noise is coming from, why it's failed. Is it flanking down the walls, for example, um, or is it coming through the floor? Um, I have seen myself go about with microscope before and put it up to the wall and the, the ceiling to try and recognise where that noise is coming through. Um, so. It, all it does very much depend, again, to use that, that phrase, it would depend on how bad it is. The majority of times, I don't think you'd have to take it all off and redo. Mm -hmm. um, but you probably need somebody with a, a degree of understanding of, of exactly what has gone wrong and try and identify exactly what can be put right. So you might have to lift the floor, for example, that's a bit of disruption, but it might be the easiest method, or it might be that you have to put in a new ceiling completely. It all depends on how badly the floor has failed and where that noise is coming from. And so presumably the acoustic testing consultant, as you say, potentially could isolate it to a number of areas, whoever was doing that testing and then help them with the remediation process. Yeah, I, I, I would totally agree with that. You, you should be asking the tester whether he can advise exactly where that noise is coming from. Um, yeah. That will be better than me walking about with a, a, a stethoscope uh, uh, checking out the walls and so I'm just trying to think with our systems, I, I can't think back to any time that we've, we've had any issues with completion, you know, with, with the testing, um, that there's been, had to give advice on that. If installed well and properly, I think you don't get a lot of issues with acoustic products, or certainly not ours. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, we have had um, issues before, um, but the, the pretty fundamental, uh, our systems are, are robust and they do allow for a degree of workmanship issues, yeah. Not necessarily, I mean, robust details do, does that, it allows for poorer workmanship issues, not chronic, um, and usually when, if we have ever been called into a, a batten system where it's failed, when you lift the floor up and look underneath, the battens may be put at 90 degrees to the joists, localised loadings, it could be upside down, you know, there are things that can go wrong, but usually they're easily identified. If they're upside down, then you're going to have to take the floor up and, and start again. Um, but the majority of times you can put it right um, relatively straightforward. So speaking of an, of issues, um, last question for you, Ian. Uh, Chester has said, um, and this is one we've heard before, I've installed an acoustic floor, but the floor squeaks. Um, is it due to the foam creating too much deflection or, or why is this? Yeah, we used to get asked this a lot about our flooring systems because they move. Um, people assumed that it was because of the foams that, that the creaks and squeaks were created. Um, but if you actually take a bit of the foam, no matter what you do to that bit of foam, you can't get it to squeak and creak. As we know, what you'll get, the squeaks and creaks will be due to timber and chipboard or the flooring connection. And if that connection, the timber against timber does squeak and creak. I live in a 19th century house here and it squeaks and creaks everywhere and there is no acoustic flooring at all in here. My wife finds it quite homely, the fact that it squeaks and creaks, especially this time of year when you've got different movement. Um, but it can be very annoying as well. And I fully understand that um, we've seen a, a, a job where the issue was solved by using a newspaper on the battens um, between the battens and the chipboard, just a piece of newspaper. And I think your, your father was there, um, Kira, when we actually solved this with the Sunday Post newspaper on top of the, the battens, then the chipboard. And because we'd stopped that chipboard to timber connection, here presto, we'd stop the squeaking. And the lady was delighted that we'd solved it with another newspaper that she was going to throw out. So. It, it's all about the movement and the moisture. Um, obviously, we're, we're experts in, in solving moisture problems, but usually that's related to condensation. But moisture is important in acoustics as well with the batten systems. And timber can move and creak. Um, one of the best uh, solutions I've seen uh, over recent years is the NHBC came up with the, the, the requirement for floors to be glued and screwed. If you're gluing, you're putting a glue line on the batten and you're gluing the floor down, it stops that movement. Then you screw rather than nail, it again tightens it up so there's less movement. And I think that's one of the main reasons we don't get asked about squeaks and creaks. Um, but it's still a problem in all the houses. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Okay, last couple of questions. So, Sue, I'll come to you for one. We have covered this a little bit in other questions that have been answered, but it's a recent one that's just been emailed by Jack. Um, do we carry out sound tests? Um, he's asked. Okay, we ourselves, we can't carry out sound testing. Um, we do have links with um, experienced acousticians that we can put, um, put, in, put you in touch with. They can carry out the sound tests. Um, they can do desktop studies by just looking at your construction, looking at your, your project, and that would give an indication as to what sort of performance you can expect to achieve. Um, we do, I think as Linda said earlier, we've got, uh, we've got a huge bank of tests that we have carried out over the years. So we can give an indication by looking at a similar type of construction. And, you know, this is like the, the, the performance that you could expect to achieve. Um, we do also, as, as Ian said earlier as well, we've got an acoustic laboratory which um, people can test their own systems in if need be, um, and you know their research and development etc. As well, so 
although we don't carry out sound tests ourselves, then we can certainly still help with, with that actual process. Okay, thank you very much, Sue. Um, and I think one last question, Mark, um, and then th that'll be us for, for the, the morning. Thank you. Um, James has asked, is there any difference in the time it takes to actually lay a baton system compared with the decking system? Yeah, that's, uh, that's another quite common question that I come across. And, uh, you know, we've, I think we've discussed the, the advantages and disadvantages between battens and decks, which has been quite good during this during this session. Uh, but the, the simple answer is it's a lot quicker to do the decking than the battens. And so that's one of the advantages because you just don't have to worry about the actual layout. We, you know, I think Linda covered how important getting the layout was right. But with decking, you know, it's a lot more straightforward. So if you have a project where speed and simplicity of installation is important, then, then look at the decking system as, as having an advantage over the batten system. Okay, brilliant. Fantastic. So I really enjoyed those questions. So it was a great mix of, you know, sort of the, the um, a technical um, questions about the acoustics, how things perform, and also the installation. So hopefully, um, you know, benefit to everyone that has watched. So firstly, well done to marketing uh, for putting this together as usual. And well done, guys, answering the questions. Linda and Mark specifically, um, your, your first ones, well done. It was really, really good. Um, and thank you very much to everyone that has come and watched our webinar live. Um, this is, I think, our 16th uh, webinar that we've done. So we're, we're, we've had about 20,000 views on our webinars. So this is something that we introduced at the start of lockdown. Um, and we will keep this going. And I'm particularly excited about our next one, which is on Friday the 30th of October at 10 a.m. So please try and join us. Um, as I said earlier, the topic will be future homes, concepts and technologies um, with Professor Sean Smith, um, who is the director of the Centre for Future Infrastructure at the University of Edinburgh. Great guy and very, very interesting. So I really hope you can join us. So you can subscribe to our channel. Um, if you can give us a thumbs up on this video, which helps us if you, if you enjoyed it. Um, and I really look forward to seeing you at the end of the month. Um, as I said earlier, you will receive a follow-up email to a replay and details of the next webinar. So please feel free to circulate that to colleagues and anyone who may find it of interest. Um, and if you can, and you do have time to fill out the short survey regarding this webinar and any, um, you know, constructive criticism or any ideas that we should be thinking of, you know, so our next webinar, we know what the next one is at the end of this month, but what else would you like to hear about? We do have a very diverse range of products and a lot of information and knowledge about things. So what else would you like to know? Please fill it out and send it back to us. We do read them and we do listen. Um, so thanks very much for coming and um, very much appreciated. Have a fabulous weekend. I hear the weather is going to be awful. Um, so have, try and have a good weekend wherever you are and we will see you on the 30th of October at 10 a.m. Thanks guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.